Hi, this is uh, Mark Mursky. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and I am here to offer a brief tutorial on the interpretation of arterial blood gases, particularly the basics and the clinical pearls. I offer no disclosures for this lecture. Uh, fundamental importance to blood gases are several, and I just will briefly go through them. Uh, since all of you are probably familiar with obtaining blood gases for some of your patients. The blood gas analysis is useful to evaluate partial pressure of gas in blood as well as the acid-base content. It uh, enables us to interpret respiratory, circulatory, and metabolic disorders. It can give us information on the partial pressure of oxygen in our bloodstream uh, and thus provide further information on how we have diffusion issues within the lungs themselves. Particularly gives us a reading on the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is highly important in our ability to interpret the patient's ventilation status. And given that the pH is dependent on acid-base factors within the plasma, we can derive information about the serum bicarbonate and base deficit or, ex or excess. Keep in mind that most of the uh, metrics within the blood gas are actually measured, the important ones such as pH and PO2 and PCO2, but the bicarbonate in particular is calculated uh, based on the pH, and then a derivative of that is the base excess or deficit. <laughs> Uh, before you are some of the common uh, normal values of the indices that we usually get with our arterial blood gas. You probably are very commonly aware of them. Some of the other terminology with respect to the blood gas are the base deficit or excess, which is the difference between measured serum bicarbonate and the normal value of approximately 27. It is a non-respiratory -res reflection of acid-base status. The anion gap is a determination of cations minus the anion concentrations. The hydrogen ion accumulation is not accounted for on the cation side, but rather decrease in the bicarbonate buffer. And hence, we will get into further the calculation of the anion gap and how that is of some importance. Respiratory acidosis is reflected in the carbon dioxide component as it is a specific respiratory acid. And metabolic acidosis is an assignment to the presence of other metabolic acids. The terms of alkalosis and, uh, are similar to the respiratory metabolic acidosis, but in the obviously other direction of the pH. The PA, PaO2 is an important assignment which we like to see in our blood gas, but keeping in mind that oxygen saturation is a standard of care in the ICU, we evaluate PaO2 more in the consideration of how the lungs are functioning in terms of whether there is a shunt or a diffusion abnormality, i.e. an AA gradient uh, present. The pH and CO2 are highly valuable in assessing the ventilation itself and the presence of any requisite acidosis or alkalosis. A quick view regarding some of the pearls of how to interpret the, the arterial blood gas. Before you, you see what would be considered a very normal blood gas of 7.40 as the pH, a PCO2 of 40, a PO2 of 100, and a bicarbonate calculate level of 25. If the pH is normal, but the PCO2 or the bicarbonate are not, then you have a compensated abnormality or mixed abnormality. And keep in mind that an arterial blood gas can certainly be abnormal even if the pH is 7.40. Regarding specifically the PCO2 and the bicarbonate, it is a common calculation that for every rise or decrement in PCO2 from the standard acceptance level of normal of 
the pH changes by approximately 0.08 up or down, depending on the rise or fall of CO2. If one has an abnormal pH and an abnormal pCO2 on your blood gas, and if you do this calculation, if the pH is accounted for by that pCO2 change, then what you are seeing before you is an acute respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. If it is not accounted for, then we have a metabolic component. And second of all, a pH change of 0.15 corresponds to a base depth base change of 10 milliequivalents per liter, and that applies to base changes not due to pCO2. So first, when you're interpreting a blood gas, it's, it's a good idea to first apply rule number one, look at the pH, look at the pCO2, and see if those match up. Either they're normal or they represent a primary respiratory alkalosis or respiratory acidosis. If they don't match up, then you can apply rule two to see whether you're dealing with a base excess or deficit. For example, below you, we see a pH of 7.25 and a pCO2 of 66. The pH change is 0.15 from normal, and the pCO2 change from normal is 26. By applying rule number one, 26 times 0 0.08 equals 0 0.21. So pH with a pure respiratory, respiratory pH change would be 7.19. Hence, our pH is uh, less, therefore, or I'm sorry, the change in pH is less, hence the respiratory acidosis is compensated by a metabolic component. Since this is not a pure respiratory acidosis, we can apply rule number two, and we get that there is a four milliequivalent bicarbonate excess, hence the pH was not as low as we would have normally calculated by just rule number one. We can use the blood gas from a patient to, to remarkable uh, findings uh, regarding our patients. For example, we have two blood gases down below. If we were told that the patient having such a blood gas was involved in a, quote, arrest situation, patient found down and was resuscitated, we can look at those two and be able to evaluate and assess whether the, the patients were either recovering from a pure respiratory arrest or they had a cardiac arrest component. For example, the first blood gas, 7.08 PCO2 of 80, PO2 of 250 and a bicarbonate of 23, there is a rise in PCO2 that is commensurate with the fall in the pH. Hence, this is a pure respiratory acidosis. And very likely, this found down patient was a consequence of an apneic arrest, which is common in the hospital setting from medications, uh, other reasons why they had a blocked airway but this was not a major cardiac arrest, as opposed to, in contrast, the second PA, the blood gas was 6.90, the PCO2 of 60 in the same PO2 and bicarbonate. If we do the calculation, we find that the pH is far lower than what could be accounted for by the PCO2 rise from 40 to 60. Hence, this is a mixed respiratory and metabolic acidosis and coincides more likely with a pure, with a true cardiopulmonary arrest. If we were told that this was a witnessed arrest, hence the cardiac component occurred immediately, we could have determined actually the time that this arrest happened from the time uh, till the blood gas was obtained, typically which occurs after the patient is intubated and provided 100% oxygen. We can do that because the rise of PCO2 in our blood gas is a consequence of our apneic state and duration, but also on our metabolic state. In awake patients who would fall from an immediate uh, cardiac arrest, um, but uh, were otherwise uh, of normal physiology, they would have a rise in PCO2, as you see at the bottom, of about one to two millimeters of mercury per minute. 
which contrasts to patients who, for example, are, are awake and alive and breath holding and in complete normal metabolic state, they we typically produce about six to seven millimeters of mercury per minute of rise of piece of CO2 in our bloodstream. And in between are patients such as anesthetized patients or brain death, which are somewhere in between those two extremes. But if we had the latter case of a pure cardiac arrest and two millimeters of mercury per minute, we could have gone back to the previous PCO2 of 60 and recognize that that rise of 20 from the normal value of 40 would have taken about 10 to 20 minutes, and that was probably the duration of the arrest time. If, again, the PCO2 does not fully explain a low pH, we have a metabolic acidosis that is concomitantly present or purely present. We then would like to know whether there is an anion gap, which is the difference between the positive ionic uh, elements in plasma minus the negative ions. And a normal gap is typically of 3 to 11 when you take the sum of sodium minus chloride and bicarbonate. We often correct that for patients with a severe hypoalbuminuria, excuse me, albin, albuminemia, because albumin is the principal negative ion that is part of that anion gap of 3 to 11. So if there's a non-anion gap, bicarbonate loss is, is if there, in a non-anion gap, the bicarbonate loss is concomitant with the rise in chloride, hence there is no gap. If there is an anion gap present, there is an organic present, organic acid present, which can be ruled out or investigated by using the mnemonic mud piles for the different diagnoses down below, whether it's methanol, diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, et cetera. And finally, from the information from the PO2, we can look at the diffusion characteristics of the lungs via the AA gradient, which is normally about 10 to 20. Uh, and an easy way to calculate it is to found below where you just take the PO2 of the arterial bl blood gas and divide it by the FiO2. And if it's less than 285, this is consistent with, with the presence of a significant diffusion issue. So thank you very much and hope that helps uh, your interpretation of the blood gases.